So uh, this is the article that uh, Stefan was mentioning. It's about monetary policy as a means for economic control. And the most important aspects I he present here during this talk, and for going more into depth, I definitely can recommend um, checking out the article because you know I can just make a, a brief overview on, on the depth of where we're going to. So yeah, let's start. You all have heard the saying, money rules the world. And I would like you to think of when was the last time that you were thinking about that? So for me, uh, this, this came up uh, frequently actually, and uh, one very important aspect was when I see uh, lobbyists that uh, were able to influence politics with the money they have. And, but money essentially depends on the system that it is uh, like built around. And the structure of the monetary system actually defines how money is used. And here, uh, Bitcoin is a freedom technology. So I see that Bitcoin brings very different properties than the fiat money, which is essentially a means of control. And this is what I would like to present to you today. And first I will lay out why the fiat money is a means of control. And then I will go into the antithesis to the system, namely Bitcoin. So first, I would like to go back in time with you to the gold standard. And I would like to show you how lending worked during the gold standard. So here you have a bank. This is a balance sheet of a bank. Here you see the assets that the bank owns, which is in this case only gold. So this bank was a gold custody only. And for the gold, gold it held in custody, it was giving out warehouse receipts. And it turned out that the people could then also use these warehouse receipts as a form, as a medium of exchange, because it was not dependent on the owner or like on the, on the name on it. But you can just take this receipt and go to the gold custody and get your gold out. So what happens when a loan is given out? So first I would like to stress that the bank is then not only operating as a gold custody anymore, but also as an investment vehicle. So it is giving out gold to the one who was lending some gold, and this influences those who were giving the gold to the bank in the first place. So essentially, those that hold these warehouse receipts that gave the gold to the bank are an investor in an investment fund. So it's both custody and investment fund. And if an investment fund does their business honestly, they should check out with the investors and they should explain the risk of this loan. And this is how it would work in an ideal case. And now I would like to show you how it evolved. So on the left side, we have the same as before. And then a new loan was given out. And then the balance sheet was simply extended on both sides. So it was not that this gold was given out, but you know, just a new loan was placed under the asset as, a, as, a, as an asset, essentially. And new warehouse receipts were created that were not backed with gold. And this is essentially fraudulent behavior. Because imagine everyone goes back to the bank and wants to get back their gold. Then the last ones will not get the gold because there are unbacked receipts in the system. And this, you see that the balance sheet was just extending. And this is how it worked with fraud, essentially. And now we have a look how the current system works. And you see, um, it is basically the same, same makeup. And you see we also have here an extension of the balance sheet on both sides. But I will um, like guide you through this a little bit more. So this principle applies for both central banks and banks. 
And I would like to like show you how how it works for central banks. So here we have the balance sheet of the central bank. And here on the asset side, you have the claims on loans, which is an asset. And then you have the deposits from banks, many commercial banks, and the government. And then when the central bank gives us out a new loan, it is simply added on the asset sheet. I have to change that, All right? It's added to the asset sheet, and it's also uh, added to the asset side, and it's also added to the liability side. So the bank has now a new claim on the loan, and the money is simply created out of thin air and placed on the deposit uh, account of the debtor. So nothing is transferred here, no money is transferred, it is simply created out of thin air. And when you see, this, is, this approach is exactly the same as we had here during the, the lending of the gold standard where we had unbacked receipts. And what happens when we extend the monetary, the money supply? This leads to a debasement, so every monetary account is less worth, and this is inflation essentially. And Rothbard was saying something very important on that. So he's a, he's a very famous Austrian economist. And he says, it is in fact difficult to see the economic or moral difference between the issuance of pseudo receipts and the appropriation of someone else's property or outright embezzlement or more directly counterfeiting. Most present legal systems do not outlaw this practice. In fact, it is considered basic banking procedure. So this means that these, this issuance of pseudo receipts was essentially a dispossession of someone else's property. And he also says here, as we, we saw before, that most present legal systems do not outlaw this practice. It's completely legal. It is even much more than that. It's basic banking procedure. And this is not the case only for central banks, but also for banks. So, and this has great implications. So I, I go into this in much more depth in my article. Um, but when we can, what are the mechanics on um, credit creation? And especially when does a bank create credit? And this is very much influenced by the refinancing rates. So at which rate can a bank get money at the central bank? The bank needs central bank money to process transactions, essentially. So when a bank has, when there is a reduced refinancing rate, the banks can borrow more at central banks, which they need for transactions. And so they can expand their business by giving out more debt because they can much more easily refinance themselves. So, and since banks are living in a competitive environment, they are reducing the interest on debt to attract new debtors. And then so when the interest rate lowers, then there's more demand for debt, more people are willing to take on this debt, and so more debt is created. And this essentially leads to boom and bust cycles. So there's a boom because the interest rate was artificially reduced, and this eventually has to go into a bust because it's unsustainable. I can very much recommend the article by Ben Kaufman, Bitcoin and the Business Cycle, who explains this mechanism in great depth. But now we continue and explain, and I explain a little bit what the depth actually means for a normal person. So let's say I am getting a credit from a bank to buy a house. And then this house is a security for my credit. And when I cannot pay back my debt, then the bank may seize the house or they can reduce my risk rating. So essentially they have a lot of power over me when I uh, take on a debt and they can do so by just creating this money out of nowhere. And this goes even further with the money creation through asset purchase. So I will go back to the schema that I used before. But now I explain how money is created with asset purchase. So again, 
banks and central banks can create money by buying assets. Here we again have the balance sheet of the central bank. We have the asset side, which are claims on, um, on, on bonds like the government bonds and which are then uh, noted as an asset. And then you have the deposits at, as before with the commercial banks and the government, the uh, government account. And now let's assume that the central bank buys a government bond. This government bond is simply added to the asset side. And then the money is created out of thin air and placed in the deposit account of the seller of the government bond. So assume, so this is always working for commercial banks. Now imagine a commercial bank is selling a government bond to the central bank. Then the commercial bank gets simply added a new number, the, the price of for which it sold the government bank to its deposit account. And the government bond is added as an asset on the balance sheet. So this means the Fed can essentially infinitely buy assets on the market. They can also exercise direct control on the economy through the selective purchase of assets. So they can decide which asset is bought more and which not. So they can decide who gets the funding. And yeah, essentially ownership is also transferred to the Fed in the end. Relevant assets are primarily government bonds. So the central bank primarily buys government bonds, but also mortgage-backed securities, bonds from companies, and stocks, this is more, this happened most recently. They're buying ETFs, which is kind of a bundle stock. And here I would look, like to show you the Standard & Poor Index, um, what happened in the last month. We see that here was a great crash, it was in March, and you remember it was during the lockdown. And the price of the stocks was just falling. And at one point it magically turned upward. And yeah, maybe you can imagine already what happened. The, whoops, the central bank was buying up these stocks. So it was exactly on the 23rd of March, 2020, when the Fed announced that it's buying ETFs to stabilize the market, which actually means pumping up the markets, although we already have a bust. And this is the funny thing, investors are already selling these stocks, but we're not seeing a crash, we're not seeing a complete bust because it is hidden through the, the program of the Federal Reserve buying up the Standard & Poor 500 uh, ETF uh, stocks. And what is happening thereby? The investors who actually did a, a mis malinvestment because they bought overvalued assets are bailed out because they can just sell it to the Fed for high prices. And here the bank, of course, uh, works as an intermediary. So I would like to rephrase the quote in the beginning or the saying in the beginning, money rules the world to those who create money out of thin air rule the world. And now I show you where I actually have this pyramid from. It's on the US $1 note. And this pyramid actually explains quite nicely what we're seeing in the financial system. So I placed it like this. Um, I consider the Fed even superior to the government and of course superior to banks. And I want to explain you why. But first I would like to tell you that the Fed was actually created by uh, many banks coming together and, um, so, and intending to create the Fed to get these bailouts so they can make actually more risky investments or risky procedures. So this is where the Fed is coming from. I can very much recommend the book, The Creature of Jekyll Island, which explains this very well. I'm just at the beginning, but it's very enlightening. And. Um, so this is actually a banking cartel. And as we saw, they are creating money out of thin air and Rothbard calls this out as um, dispossession. And this is completely legalized. So it is government backed, this banking cartel essentially. So central banks exercise influence on the economy through dictating monetary policy. And this power is directly related to the ability to create money out of thin air. 
the banks and the central bank can both create money out of thin air, but they can only do so because it's legalized. So in theory, the government could come and say, okay, we don't want this banking procedure, now let's go to Bitcoin. But, you know, it's, it's not very realistic because the government is very much um, profiting from the system because they can easily finance themselves um, by just uh, selling these government bonds that are then bought up uh, by the Federal Reserve. And so the government is very much dependent on the Federal Reserve. So I don't see this as coming. And here I have this from the Federal Reserve Annual Report. It actually says that the funds of the Federal Reserve are going to the Treasury. So they are working very much together. And this, you can see this in the annual report. Now, for giving you a little bit of a context, why I thought that uh, the Federal Reserve is actually superior um, to to the government, I found this here. It's the it's the hearings before the Senate and of the House of Representatives. So there was an investigation on the on the banking system, and this is what they found out. And I would like to just read out what they what they found. Quote: Let us control the money of a country, and we care not who makes its laws. This is the maxim of the House of Rothschilds and the foundation principle of European banks. If a country and its people are mortgaged for the assessed value of their property, and the bankers control the money, the bondholders are not the people own that country. It makes no difference whether you call it a republic or a monarchy. The people can never be free as the borrower is the servant to the lender. So what can we do with that? Um, we now have an alternative. We have Bitcoin. And it is an alternative to the central banking system. With Bitcoin, money cannot be created out of thin air, but only through a process called mining. And Europe was calling Bitcoin a super massive monetary gravitation object, which actually pulls in value. But I would like to think this a little bit further because actually people are more and more coming into Bitcoin we thinking about the whole uh, fiat system that we have right now, questioning this whole system, questioning centralized authorities, and um, more and more realizing the importance of property and freedom and the ability to save, which is not possible in a highly inflating currency. So I see we have a confrontation of different value systems. Namely, the centralized version around the Federal Reserve, which is a lot about dependence, centralization, and essentially serfdom. And then we have Bitcoin, which brings in self-sovereignty, decentralization, and freedom. Because we can use these Bitcoins as a, it's, as a property to save for the future and then even maybe buy a house and be completely self-dependent. Or we can think this even further that, you know, thinking about the monetary system, this just set the stone rolling and going much more further into organizational structures. So we are questioning this whole organizational structure we have right now, and we think of alternatives. And the role of a centralized authority is more and more challenged. Do we really need it? Or is a free market maybe much more reasonable? And here, Austrian economists also really much come into play. So I truly think that we have parallel societies forming around Bitcoin and central banking. So some people will be rather stuck in this old system, work in these whole mechanics, bureaucracy, tax, everything. And more and more people want to have a Bitcoin citadel, which is essentially a free private city, where only the most basic things are provided by the structure, which is uh, defense, inner security, and the provision of, let's say, um, uh, an organ organization to settle fights. Kind of a, a law structure, law thing, but um, competition amongst these is also very much wanted. And there is no healthcare because everyone can, can do this on their own. But yeah, if you don't have to pay so much to your health insurance, which is, uh, which is, not voluntary here, but which you have to do, then you can think of uh, alternative means, which are, for example, not supported here in Germany where I'm living, 
Um, so I would be definitely better off uh, in such a system. So I hope to see you in the Bitcoin Citadel. And I would like to end this talk with don't trust, verify. And I hope I could give you some inspirations. And I would like to invite you to really go into the depth to understand why the structure is the way I, I showed you and uh, challenge everything, challenge everything that I say. And you can follow me on Twitter with uh, at Stephanie B. Jane. <laughs> Thank you.